Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Today, we are welcoming back to the show, Mr. Chris Vermeulen. Chris is an internationally recognized expert trader whose work is featured in dozens of financial publications and websites. He is the founder of the Technical Traders LTD. Chris is an expert in the technical analysis of financial markets, and we are thrilled to have him back today to give us an update on the overall trajectory of the different sectors and how they have changed since the last time he was here way back in August. So this show is going to be all about what is hot and what is not. Chris, welcome back to the show. How are you today? I am great. Thanks for having me, Michelle. We are thrilled to have you here. This is going to be an incredibly interesting show because August seems like it was years ago now, it doesn't does. it? <laughs> everything is changing so fast. I really want to cover everything, Chris. All the big sectors, including precious metals, cryptocurrencies, real estate, the stock market, and of course, cash. From your perspective, as a technical analyst, where are the biggest changes so far? Well, we've definitely seen a big rotation in terms of what sectors you know were leading last year to what sectors are leading this year. And there's really, we're still kind of up in arms as to which sectors are going to be the next big leaders to take us forward. So if we uh, look at what was last year, it was clean energy, solar um, technology, biotech. We really saw those sectors doing exceptionally well. And, and this, this time around, we're, we're, they've really taken a back seat. Actually, believe it or not, the solar sector is down near the bottom of the pile of one of our worst performing uh, sectors over the last couple of months, along with gold miners. I mean, they're just, we've lost total favor in a lot of those, those sectors. And now we're seeing dirty energy, like oil, the oil sector doing very well on um, the retail sector, which goes against, you know, everyone's bone in their body. Like if we're in lockdown, how are you supposed to do retail? Yet retail is one of the strongest sectors right now. Uh, so if there's a big rotation, we're going from all tech and retail is going out the window last year to complete opposite now. So it's pretty interesting, um, you know, tech to retail and from clean energy to dirty energy. So it's just money sloshing back and forth in this market, trying to figure out where things are going. Now, last year, I think it's pretty obvious. We, we saw the lockdown. People naturally went into technology as the safe haven play. Uh, but now that we see vaccine and we start to see the rollout, people are realizing it's not the end of the world. The economic cycle is going to, you know, it's going to unfold and do better. So people are looking into energy and back into retail. People are dying to go shopping. And so, you know, it's coming back, you know, everything goes in and out of favor. It's just trying to catch them at the right time. Right. So. You know, you mentioned something that's very interesting. Um, everybody's talking about how e-commerce is going to take off. And I completely agree, obviously. But people have been in lockdown so long. I'm just going to talk on a personal note. Mm. I am dying to go out to the malls and go shopping physically shopping, looking, because I'm going to tell you something, a lot of people window shop and they love getting out in the communities and they love the, to try on clothes, whether they try, you know, whether they buy it or not, they just want to try it on. They want to yeah. look, they want to see. So as much as e-commerce, everybody's talking about everything is going that direction and the malls are absolutely dying what do you see in the future of this? I could be completely wrong. Maybe I just have, you know, I've been locked down for too long, but what's your perspective on that? I, I think you're right. I think, um, I think we saw a pretty good bump in retail sales um, this summer when things kind of let off a little bit. Everyone, I think, is dying to go shopping. I don't like to shop. I'm not a shopper. My wife has to drag me out. Uh, but I'm, I would love to go shopping, go to some stores that, you know, that I want to go to and, and just cruise around. I mean, it's spring, so it's like fishing season, boating season, hiking and all that stuff. So, I mean, I'd love to go shopping. Um, nice. So, it's, it's going to be, I think there's going to be a good surge, I guess, again, in, in retail. People are dying to get out there. So, I think you're spot on. I mean, a lot of people are just itching to get out there. Now, over the winter, my wife did all my shopping for me online, buying clothes, and it's a nightmare. I mean, the amount of shirts and suits and pants that go back and forth and you send one back and you get a new one. You're like, ooh, I like the actually the other size better. And then it's got to go back again. So, 
I mean, this whole clothing shopping online is painful. <laughs> you know, that leads me into real estate. It's, it's very interesting in terms of commercial real estate, because right now everybody's, you know, sort of trying to get rid of it. You know, oh, it's, it's, it's fallen out of favor. But I honestly think within the next three to five years, if we ever get out of this, yeah. there's going to be a surge in that sector. So let's turn to real estate. What do you foresee, not just in the commercial sector, but also in the uh, local home? sector. Where is that going? Yeah. I mean, it's, we're obviously in a massive, yeah, we're in a bubble. I mean, you look at where I am, I'm just North of Toronto. Toronto's jumped another 20%. It went up like 50% in the last year. I mean, the real estate, retail, real estate, like uh, homeowners have just gone through the roof. Commercial, obviously everyone was panicking, but I think people are realizing it's not the end of the world. Chris, let's turn to precious metals real quick. We have had a wild ride over the past couple of months. So talk to us about precious metals, the sector itself, and um, what about these new bull runs? And also, which do you prefer? Do you like silver or gold? Right, yeah, it's a, I like them both for different reasons. Um, so the precious metal sector is in a bull market. Gold's been in a bull market since 2019. Silver started one last year. Platinum started one, you could argue November or sorry, December or January this year. So those three metals are doing really well. Um, they're just in the infancy stage. I think there's lots of upside potential over the next two or three years. Um, gold has got very nice looking chart patterns. I like gold. It's kind of the global kind of hedge against when people get nervous, they kind of start to buy gold. And of course, um, it's a little slower moving than silver, obviously. So gold's kind of got this nice, big, stable platform. Um, it's got, I don't know how to say it, like real investors, like global people who buy it and keep it forever. And then you've got silver's a lot more speculative. People move in and out very quickly. There's obviously a lot of silver stackers. I'm one of them. I love silver because there's lots of upside potential. Um, but gold's kind of the, the, the big, slow moving one that I, I rely on more um, to hold its value. Silver, I think, can lose a lot of value very quickly. And it's not something I would want to start as much in. I like a nice mix. Um, when you look at the gold mining stocks and gold in general, we've seen those been, they've been trading lower for like a year. They just are out of favor, continuing to pull back. Uh, when you step back though, and you look at the big long-term chart it is very bullish pattern. And looking forward, you know, six, eight, 12 months from now, we should see gold and miners through the roof. They should be probably hitting new highs and really taking off. So I'm really excited about precious metals. Um, they're in like a 10 to 15, maybe a 20 year bull market for commodities. I think we're going to see a big full swing, similar to what we saw back in 2002, 2004, when gold and miners put in a major bottom. We're seeing the same type of cycle where everyone is piled into real estate right now. They all want equities, stocks, uh, and commodities are the lowest value they've been in like 80 or 100 years. And so we're back down at that extreme level. Eventually, just like everyone piled into tech and dropped retail, now we're seeing the opposite where everybody's going into retail and dropping tech. Um, I think we're going to see the same thing when it comes to um, precious metals. We're going to see everyone pile into precious metals because I think there's going to be more financial un in instability going forward. Eventually, all this has got to catch up. The stimulus plans, the printing, we don't know when, but the more they do it, the bigger the potential problem. And it's just a matter of time before everyone starts to move kind of maybe a little bit out of real estate, a little bit out of equities, and they start to buy gold because they're going to start to worry about currencies more. But I think that's a long-term play. I think this is going to unfold over two, three years or more. So gold's got a long ways ahead of it, I think, to the upside. It's not going to be right away. I think it's going to be a multi-year rally. It's not going to be explosive, but it should be like kind of nice and steady, just chugging away as that kind of hedge against, you know, the currencies and devaluation and all those things. So I really like metals. I think there's a lot of upside. Just um, it's just a time. You got to let it mature. Yeah. It's really interesting that what you're seeing as far as the green stocks go in that sector has not taken off the way Everyone was predicting. I remember the last time you were here, you were saying, stay in cash, keep in cash, and don't worry about the green, you know, 
it sort of ignored. And everyone at that time was saying, oh, my God, get out of cash and get into the green stocks. And you are exactly right. It's very interesting that green stocks they haven't taken off yet. Now, we don't know. And the metals are tied intimately with that, you know, copper, cobalt, mm-hmm. you know, um, What's your prediction as far as those metals into the future as, um, so I'm, I'm not speaking about the Green New Deal, but what I am talking about is, you know, the advancement as far as green technology goes. What do you foresee? Yeah, I th- well, there's going to, obviously, as we go more green, it requires different materials for, I mean, we're looking at electricity. So you need stuff that's very conductive, silver, gold, uh, copper, all those things, right? So as we continue to be more, go more green, we're going to need more and more of these metals. And um, solar is pretty big into obviously silver. The solar market is still continuing to expand. So I think there's going to be lots of demand. I think we're in, we're, we're finally having this big shift. I think COVID really sparked a lot of people to look at the world in a, in a bit different way and their lifestyle, um, realizing, you know, health is number one, because as soon as you think you're going to die, really money doesn't matter anymore. Who, who cares how much you've got? or how little you've got. It's all about survival, right? And after people got over that, they realized, you know what, it'd be nice to make this world safer, cleaner, better. And that's, I think, one of the big reasons why we saw clean energy and this big movement of people trying to help the environment, uh, you know, mother nature, all that stuff. So we're seeing these, these big moves. And I think it's going to play into metals. I think the green energy is in the infancy stage. I would love to see you know, lots of green energy really explode. Like Elon Musk, I don't know if you ever saw that. He wanted to do that small small area on the map. It's like this tiny little cube, but it's enough to power like half of the United States if they did all the solar. And of course, you get politics involved, you get leaders involved. And of course, it gets shut down because they're not going to make their money through other channels. But I mean, if only we could clear the slate with all those people and focus on making the world a better place, I mean, there's, we have all the technology we do we, we, possible to make the world a much better place, a cleaner place, yet the big leaders, all the shyster stuff that goes on with politics, I mean, it ruins everything. It's unfortunate. So It's kind of the old guard. You know, you talk about dirty energy. It's a, it's a good way to put it. It's just, I think a shift in awareness is definitely coming. Yeah. And a lot of money with it too, right? Yeah. Well, a lot of big oil companies are going green, right? They're starting to get on the green side of things. So it's coming. But I mean, there's so much money and so, and, and so many people can control how much they make with, with oil. I mean, they don't want to lose the grasp of oil yet, but all those oil companies are starting to get green so they can hopefully get a, a lock on the, on the other side of the equation. <laughs> you know, all it's going to take is one big company saying, hey, man, I'm going green. And then, because that's the way it goes. It's like, no, everyone's afraid to do anything until the first person does it or the first entity does it. And then everybody has to follow her mentality, right? Yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, this leads me into cryptos. Are you a fan? What are your thoughts on cryptos? Because we've got like really big, diverse opinions. It's going to go to a million dollars. It's going to disappear tomorrow because the central banks are going to shut it all down. Yeah. What do you what do you see as far as the big picture goes, Chris? I'm really in no man's land when it comes to cryptos. One of my good friends, he helps start one. He helps kind of manage one. I mean, there's hundreds of them. There's probably thousands now. I I, I mean, the list goes on and on. Um, I own some Bitcoin. That is it. Not a whole lot. Um, I don't know. I follow it. It looks like it's ready to run to about 72,000 right now. It's got a very bullish chart pattern. It's in a bubble phase. I mean, you can't fight it. Does it go to 72? Does it go to 100, uh, 100,000? I mean, it's all possible. The chart's super strong and everybody's talking about it and piling in. So I'm not a huge fan of it. I find it's way too volatile to to want to throw your money in it and, and keep a store of value. It's a, definitely, to me, it's a very big gamble. It's kind of like um, a lotto ticket in a way, right? I'm sure you can make a lot, but it's uh, when you lose 20, 30 or 50% or more, if it drops, I mean, it's hard to make 20 or 30 or 50% back of your money, right? So I don't like stuff that's that volatile. I don't mind tinkering with it and playing a little bit, but uh, it's not my thing. I think there's going to be rules and regulations and there's accounts being hacked and there's you lose your code, you're, you know, you can't get your money back. It seems... 
it seems like I've got, you know, hundreds and or hundreds of passwords and logins mm-hmm. for sites. Do I really need to try and remember one more long string key to, <laughs> <laughs> to try and get my money back? I don't care about losing emails or access to a service, but yeah, I don't, I'm not, I don't need any more levels to find it harder to get your money back. Yeah, it's a thing, you know what I mean? That, to make it more, it's like they sit around and, and make it, you know, they need, you know, five different verification levels and then, you know, it needs a string of 33 and then you have, you know what I mean? And then we need yeah. to, ding, to ding your phone and then, you know, it's just yeah. craziness. Yeah, it's, um, it's a little it's a little complex, I think. I think mm-hmm. seniors probably really will, just, I mean, I find it a struggle. So. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't I, put a lot of effort into it though. So that that's half the reason. If you're passionate about it, it's no problem. You figure it out. But I'm not passionate about cryptos. That's not my, that's not where I like to trade. It's not where I like to, you know, try and make my money. So I don't know it because I just don't focus on it. Okay. Now that we've spent the first half of our interview just chatting, I want to get down to the nitty gritty. (laughs) You are a professional analyst and you carry portfolios. And I want to know what is hot, what is not, where you're going, what is the optimum portfolio right now? That is a loaded question. (laughs) Now, that question will vary dramatically depending on um, the individual, the country you're in, your age, how much money you have. Um, So we could break it down into a couple of different ways. So if you want to go minimalistic, like the KISS, keep it simple strategy type thing, um, there's a time when to be long stocks and there's a time when you don't want to be in the stock market. So I've got a strategy that just trades two ETFs, it's either you're long the SP 500 or you're long the NASDAQ when all the technicals are in favor and the stock market is going up and and showing signs of continued growth. So you just go into one ETF, you buy the index and that would be like 100% of your portfolio. And then when the market starts to become unfavorable, we start to see other certain sectors breaking down. We see other sectors starting to lead like potentially gold, utilities, um, uh, corporate, or sorry, uh, bonds. Um, then you want to start to step back and potentially exit the stock market and move to cash. Or if bonds are performing and acting as a true safe haven, which they don't always do, but if they are a safe haven, then you move into like a TLT, the 100% into the bond market, and you just ride bonds until the uncertainty starts to um, brew and you see bonds move higher and eventually we hit targets. And then eventually we'll move back to cash until the stock market becomes favorable. So you're just removing into the stock market and then into bonds potentially, and then back into cash. And then you wait for the cycle to repeat. And there's usually, you know, six, seven of these trades every year. And it's pretty, pretty straightforward. You're just going on these, you know, 30 to 60 day cycles and, and you ride it that way. Now, um, another strategy that we trade is called the band trading strategy, the best asset now. And that uses relative strength. We look for the market leading sectors. And when the stock market's got a new buy signal, we look for what are the top three sectors moving in the market? Which ones are showing all the characteristics of being a new leader or continuing to be the current leader? And so we move into those and we trade those actively, constantly looking for like a 7%, a 15%, 20% target. And we just slowly scale out of those until we eventually move back to cash because we found the stock market goes in these wave-like cycles and the average cycle is about 39 trading days. And usually we hit our targets and then we move to cash because the market starts to give us these mixed signals saying, hey, things are getting unstable. It's uh, we're seeing other sectors, defensive sectors starting to outperform the stock market, which means big money is rotating out of the stock market, out of the leaders. They're trying to get protective. And when we see the big money doing that, that's definitely our sign to, hey, we got to ride their coattails. Let's finish trimming profits here, move to cash. We'll wait for the new big wave of money. So that's the band trading strategy. And right now we're looking at, you know, like the oil sector, retail is really good. Um, so those are kind of like the leading sectors. Technology is actually coming back up on the list in the last couple of days. Um, so there's some interesting plays going on. Real estate is starting to do well. Um, uh, so those are kind of the, the, the ways to look at the market. It depends on how active you want to be. Obviously, if you're a long-term investor, um, you really just almost want to be 100% equities. 
um, until there's a bear market and then you move to cash or you buy bonds and you do the same strategy. It's really the same strategy, just broken into different timeframes and different investment vehicles. Do you do ETFs long-term? Do you do kind of the shorter rotation or do you go into just the hot sectors when the stock market's favorable and then move to cash when it's not? So we kind of do a mix of all those. The ideal portfolio would be all of them blended together, a portion of your portfolio broken into each strategy. There's kind of three different time frames. So as one's not doing so well, the other one's probably doing really well. And so they kind of are countering each other, right? So that's kind of the ideal strategy from a really high level. You know, this is the reason I love to bring you on this show, Chris, because you you are such a solid trader. You're so, um, you know, risk adverse, as they say, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, and, and I love that because right now people are, they're risking their money on things so fast and then they lose it and then they want uh, yeah. something and then they lose it. And it's so volatile right now. Mm. And you have a strategy that you've used for so long. And a lot of it, I'm going to go back, is a lot about cash. You're such a contrarian, you know, um, so many people say, you know, don't hold cash, don't hold cash because of the printing scenario. I wanted, I want you to talk to us about your strategy in terms of cash. Uh, yeah, cash is a huge part, believe it or not, um, about 35, 40% of the year we're, we're in cash with our swing trading account, like our short term trading, we're in cash a huge chunk of the year. The market is just not favorable for certain weeks or sometimes a couple months stretch. And if it's not favorable to own stocks and bonds keep falling, where else are you going to go? And there's no point in owning something that's losing value. To me, riding that roller coaster is an absolute waste of time. So I love cash. Cash is like the best thing because you just cash out and you go, this market's not favorable. And I can tell by our indicators that we've got at least five days before things are going to become bullish or we're so far away, like the, the, the crash last year, uh, you can see how far we were. We're like, we're at least a month away that we don't need to worry about investing and, and reallocating our, uh, our portfolio. We can go do whatever we want. I mean, that was prime time for day trading. Um, when one strategy falls out of favor, there's always other strategies that are really good. So what makes a really good trader and investor is to have a whole bunch of different strategies that when the market falls out of favor for this and we move to cash, we can be, hey, well, this is insane volatility. These two, three, five percent moves intraday, we could day trade that and make a fortune during this, this chaos. So you really need to know when to step back with one, put the cash aside, fire up the next strategy that works with this condition, or you just step back and you go do something else. Like day trading is a job to me. It's like requires a lot of time, a lot of prep pre-market, you're following moves and trades. And I mean, it's day trading people get hooked to because it feels like it's it's a game. I mean, it's high paced. It's emotional. You're throwing tons of money for small moves and you're trying to make money really quick. And that to me is more of a job. I like to get into sectors, catch tides, rising tides in the market. When the tides leveling off or becoming choppy, we step back until we either see it start to continue to go higher or it rolls over. And we look for if money's coming out of one sector, it's got to be going somewhere else. So we've created our software that we can see where the money's flowing in, where the money's flowing out of, and we just move from sector to sector trying to catch these cycles. So that's kind of what we focus on. And uh, that's my strategy. I don't want to have to trade and watch the charts all day, every day. I want to be able to go live life and do other things uh, when the market's not favorable. Well, it's real comforting that you're kind of a big picture trader. You know what I mean? You step back and you, you watch it slowly and you watch it rise and that's where you put your money into. The t so you can actually see a month out. You know, people that are looking right now don't look a month out. They look like, no. what's it going to do tonight? You they know? Well, perfect example is we've built uh, some custom indicators that we can read the fear in the market. And we had this about a week and a half ago where um, when our indicators start to spike, really it's, it's, it's a mix of a few different indicators or uh, different volume flows into the stock indexes and things. But when, when this indicator starts to give off this, this reading, 
we can see the panic in the market. And we were telling subscribers, because even subscribers were starting to panic. They're like, oh my gosh, this market's selling off. It was only three down days in the market. And people were actually really panicking across the board, across the web. Subscribers were panicking. And I said, listen, guys, we knew this was coming. All of our indicators are saying everyone is very scared right now. They're panicking. They're selling out. And we all know that when people are panicking, that's when bottoms are made. Everybody dumps their shares. They panic. And we should be excited. And so I drew it on the charts. I said, look, at we've got everything aligning. People are freaking out. You guys are freaking out. This is called a market bottom. And let's watch this unfold over the next two or three days. It usually takes three days for the global fear to work itself out. Um, and, then, and then the markets rallied and you know, we're along the NASDAQ and the NASDAQ's up the most in this whole rally over the last uh, few weeks. Um, and, and people are like, oh my gosh, like, how do you know that? I'm like, this is what I try and teach you guys every day. Like read, read this, if you're scared, if you've got this herd mentality and you're scared with everyone, you know, you're doing things at the exact wrong time. Um, so it's just really interesting. And that's like a short-term perspective. When I step back as a long-term investor or a, a position trading, something that lasts several months of trade, we, we gauge the same thing. We use a bit different indicators. We use some cycles, uh, but we can still see the level of fear in the market. And we're looking for big money flows going in or coming out. And we want to see if fear is rising or fear is dissipating. And as long as you know if fear is going up or going down, you can safely navigate the market. And so the key is trying to identify how to know when fear is rising or falling. And sometimes when it's just holding steady, that's actually when you see gold do really well. Gold will start to outperform when people become fearful. Now, like the stock market climbs a wall of worry. So when there's worry, we want to tip the market typically goes up, which is, and when there's panic in the stock market, uh, like actual real panic, which is the next level up from fear, um, we see everything sell off, including gold. So, and that's one way we can tell when there's actually panic in the stock market. If stocks crash, selling volume spikes up and gold sells off as well, that is, that's a panic sign. That's a sign that people are really in a panic and they don't care what they're holding in their portfolio. They just want to liquidate. And so when they want to liquidate everything, that's a really good sign that we're going to have a standout low on the chart. We'll look back months from now going, man, if I would have just bought when everybody freaked out and when I got scared, I, you know, we would have made a fortune. And so that's what I try and groom our members and we show it on the charts and we're like, this is what we want. When people are scared, you should be excited. Like this is. I tell you, it's so interesting, Chris. It's so interesting to hear your philosophy and your strategies because they're not just based upon the economic numbers that you're looking at. They're mm -hmm. based upon the emotions of what's mm -hmm. happening with people that's going to drive those numbers. And it's, it's just, it's a, you're not a day trader, but yet it's an extremely, um, it's, it's a very interesting sort of a psychological scan of society. As you trade. It, it is. Yeah. You get a read on how people are thinking and feeling, right? And where they want to put their money. And it's it's pretty interesting. I mean, I've really focused my trading strategy. I've groomed it over the years um, to fit the lifestyle that I want. I, I hired a guy once. I flew to Texas. He ripped my life apart for a month, him and his team. And I say, this is what I this is the lifestyle I want. I want to work this many hours. I love trading. I want to help people. I have a knack with kind of explaining the markets and I really enjoy it. And I do it every day for members. And I go, how do I build, you know, a business around it that I do what I, I love and can make money at it at the same time on top of trading? And so that's what I did. And I've just been grooming a trading strategy. So I don't do the day trading because I don't want to work those kind of hours and run that extreme emotions. I run something that we get into a trade. It lasts anywhere from like three weeks to two months. And it's very casual. We're scaling out as price moves up. When it starts to roll over, we move to cash and we wait. Sometimes it's a few weeks uh, for a new trade. I mean, very, very passive, very low risk. Um, we're trading the leaders. We never duplicate in the same sector. So we're always trading three or four of the top sectors and they're all diversified. And so it doesn't really matter what the market does. One of those is most likely going to take off and skyrocket in value, if not all of them will. And, and so it's, it's really exciting, the strategy, because it's very passive. I mean, we go four months of the year that we don't, we're in cash. 
And I mean, I, what's really cool is one of the worst times for trading that I've found is actually in June, which is like prime summer here for in the Bay. So, I mean, we don't need to do a lot of activity in the summer <laughs> and you can have a lot of fun and you won't skip B, right? It's, it's, it's all about lifestyle and, and trying to reduce risk and stress. And I mean, stress is what makes people make bad decisions. Mm -hmm. They overbet too much money. They worry, they panic out, or they buy it too late because they have fear of missing out. Um, if you don't know how to read the charts, you can't read what the other people are thinking and doing. You're one of them, really. You're just on the ride, the roller coaster ride, and you need to really be able to step back and just look at the charts from a very kind of technical perspective and say, okay, this is in an uptrend. It's had a nice pause and pullback. The charts look really strong from a technical standpoint. We've got panic selling and, you know, this is a prime time. The odds are the market's going to go higher. Trends are more likely to continue than they are to re reverse. And so we've got a bunch of little things that show us, you know, this is when we should be getting in and you get in and it miraculously rallies again. You know, it's, <laughs> it's just the kind of the way the markets work, but you have to have that mindset, right? People don't, People want to be aggressive. They want to trade momentum stocks. They want to be active. They need to trade, trade, trade. And our whole philosophy, my whole philosophy is to be, we want, I want to be the most efficient trader possible. So to me, efficient trading is we trade the least, the fewest amount of trades possible. We make the most amount of money with the smallest drawdowns. That to me is super efficient. And we do it with the least amount of time required. And so that's what I've been grooming and learning and focusing on our strategy is like, if we focus on these time frames and these type of cycles, I, I honestly think we have one of the most efficient trading strategies out there for an investor and for a swing position trader. Um, it's the least amount of work, the fewest amount of trades. And we're not only beating the SP 500, but we're, we're crushing the NASDAQ, which is up dramatically over the SP 500. So people, you know, I, I have people who subscribe and they're like, there's not active enough for me. And, and they go on and on. And I'm like, you don't get it. You need to step back. It's not about trading more. It's about trading more efficiently. Right. Uh, and if I could just get that through to people's minds, but people need to be active. They need to trade fast moving stuff that pops and drops every day. And I can't cater to that mindset, right? It drives <laughs> me up the wall. <laughs> they need the stress and the worry. They need and it. What if yeah, that? They... And what if this? And what if that? Oh, I've got to move now. I mean, you know what I mean? That kind of thing. It's like, to me, I can't take that in real life, let yeah. alone in it, it's not, it's yeah, you go nowhere with it. I mean, you could trade. I know people who have been trading for 15, 20, 20 plus years, and they still like, have the same account size. They make a bunch of money at one time, and then they lose a bunch of it again. I mean, you just, it, most people don't make money, right? Like 80, 90, 95% of people lose money. If you're lucky, you really don't lose it, but you never make any. Um, it's more of a hobby. Um, so you really got to be tuned in to the markets, into your emotions. When, when I, I still get nervous sometimes, I'm like, oh man, I feel like this could go against us. And one of my old partners always said, he's like, you got to buy whenever, like buy when you cry. Like he's like, and you're totally freaking out and you're panicking and everyone else is panicking. That means like, everyone That's else when you got to buy. Yeah. So, so whenever I get really nervous, I have to take a step back and like remind myself, I'm like, okay, let's walk through these charts from ground zero again, what's going on? And when you do, you're like, this is an oversold pullback. If it does reverse, we know where our stop is and we'll get stopped out and we'll, we'll regroup if this trend changes, right? And we take losses, everyone does, and it sucks, but you can't predict the future. You can just you know, put the odds in your favor. It's a nice thing about the stock market is it's a casino, but you, the odds are in your favor, dramatically in your favor, if you know what you're doing. So. You just got to be able to manage positions, manage risk. That's it. It's just like, you know, playing poker. I mean, the odds are in your favor if you know what you're doing. And that's the truth. Yeah. You know, sure. I mean, but most people, they panic and they, they start thinking. You think too much. You know yeah. what I mean? Instead yeah. of just going with what you know and what you feel. See, yeah. this is a really interesting conversation that I want to bring everybody to, to the way you operate, because it's very different. It's vastly different than the way most traders trade. And um, it's, it's definitely my favorite just because it goes along with my personality <laughs> of just like 
chill out, let it ride, go with what you know, and stay secure. Because to me, it's all about security. It's really not about it is throwing it all to the wind. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I, I grew up, I, my parents were entrepreneurs and they ended up going bankrupt uh, when I was younger. And so I've been through a bankruptcy. I know what it's like to lose everything. You know, in Canada, you're allowed to keep your clothing and furniture, but you lose everything else. And I mean, it, it was living through that and watching what it does to, you know, uh, people's heart and soul, like you lose confidence. I mean, you lose friends, you lose, you know, investors money. I mean, it, it was the most sobering experience I think I could have got when I was younger. And so I am very protective with my money. I will much rather grow it very slow, but not lose anything than try and grow it super fast and live that volatile lifestyle. I just will just plug away. I love, I love trading. I love what I do here. I could do this forever. I will do it for forever. Um, so I'm not about trying to make a ton of money this year and double or tripling my account. That'd be amazing, but it's likely not going to happen unless you risk, you know, everything yeah. you've got and push it all in on something. And so I just want to just chug away, make money, let it keep going up and up and up. And I mean, that to me is, that's what I like. I like stability. I like consistent and I don't want stress and worrying about losing, you know, a lot of money ever. So. Right. Me neither. And I want to reiterate for everyone, you've, you've beat the NASDAQ by a major, <laughs> by, I mean, he beats everybody, right? Talk about your stats real quick before we go. Where do you Sure. Well, our, our band trading strategy, it, uh, it focuses on the three best sectors and um, we went about 75% of our trades and the average trades around 39 days. That's kind of like the cycle that that this strategy, this time frame, seems to play on. And um, we we scale out of trades. It's all about managing positions. So if you can identify the trend and you can find a good entry point uh, on a on a new trend starting, then you really got some big benefits. And because we're playing individual sectors, we're not playing the big 11 sectors like financials, technology, utilities. We're usually playing these subsectors, for example, if you take the energy sector and you look at it as like a box, all the energy groups are in that one big sector like XLE. But if you were to break it apart, there's, there's like, you know, 40 different energy sectors within the energy sector. So we're playing these smaller little ETFs that are on a different sector, like clean energy is one, solar is one. Um, and those move obviously very quickly. So we can get into these really powerful baskets of stocks where money's flowing and, uh, and ride these up. And usually we're looking for seven, 15 and 20% profit targets. And a lot of times we hit those targets, you know, within a week or two of some of these trades when the market's on fire. So it, it's pretty exciting. And when the stock market corrects, there's still money flowing into a lot of these leading sectors and they'll actually trade sideways or keep going higher while the rest of the people are, you know, getting beaten up a little bit with trading sectors that are not leading and people are panicking out of, but the leaders are more resilient. They hold up the best. They usually will continue to go higher when the market becomes choppy because people naturally are looking for, okay, well, if everything's going down, what's going up? And of course, they'll look to the leading sectors, which we were in at the beginning of the phase. And those people will kind of chase it and push it up in our favor you know, at the worst possible time for them, but <laughs> usually enough to get us over the hump to hit some more profits. <laughs> it's just so great to know you're out there and that um, you're just so different, so chill, so safe, and so successful at the same time. Boy, that that's a that's a killer combo, Chris, right now. This has been amazing. <laughs> it's always great to have you here. Now, you have a fantastic website. Please uh, take a moment to tell everybody about your website and how to follow your work. Sure. Yeah. So my website is thetechnicaltraders.com. Uh, we've got a free blog on there where we, we share advice or trading ideas and predictions uh, pretty much every other day. And um, paid subscribers, we've got paid newsletters where you can trade our investor strategy, which is very slow, passive investing. You're either long the stock market, long bonds, or in cash. Uh, we have a shorter term strategy, which is the same, but uh, it's usually got about five to seven trades a year doing that same strategy. It's just trading two ETFs. That's it. And then we've got the band trading strategy, which is 
We're always getting involved in the best asset now. At any given time, we can tell you what sector is the best. And we get in those, we catch them for, for a run, and then we move back to cash and we let the market regroup. And then we jump into the next set. So we, I kind of teach every morning I do a video, I share my screen, I walk through what happened you know, yesterday and overnight trading. And I say, hey, this is what's unfolding this morning. These positions are up or down in pre-market. We're seeing fear or no fear. Um, I think one of the things a lot of subscribers love to hear is when we're in positions and I go on in the morning, I say, listen, there's panic selling in the market. You know, the market's down half a percent or 1%. And a lot of them get really excited because typically the market's open lower and then they, they, they rip to the upside because if, uh, if there's a gap on the charts, gaps tend to get filled. And if we're in an uptrend and there's panic, everything is screaming, this market's going to rally. And so a lot of them are short-term day traders and they'll get in there and you know, they'll just make a fortune in the morning on the gap fill in you know the first hour or two. And the emails are awesome because it's kind of like just icing on the cake, right? They can just get in there, have a really high probability trade. And a lot of our traders are very active. They'll trade my morning analysis all the time, um, all around our other stuff. They just want to be more active because I don't trade that much. So, but they'll use my analysis and they'll trade all day with it because we'll send out an afternoon update. Look at this. We just hit a measured move. It's probably going to pull back or it just broke out, get ready for an end of day short squeeze. And so I give lots of insight for sh for really all spectrum of traders. It's just, I'm not really active in terms of firing out lots of trades, but if you're an active trader, you can take you know what we share every day and you can make some pretty good magic with it. Thank you so much for coming on this show today. We're going to have you back probably once every three months or so because sure. things are changing so quickly now yeah. and uh, to get your perspective while everyone else is losing their minds, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> Mr. Chris Vermillion, expert financial analyst and the founder at thetechnicaltraders.com. For the industry experts panel, I'm Michelle Halliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com.